Hello and welcome back. In the previous video we have seen how to deal with the bias of a Markov chain Monte Carlo estimator and we will continue from there and will now discuss the mean squared error of such an estimate. The error is made up another term, namely the variance and as you will remember for basic Monte Carlo the bias was not there and we just had the variance. From that we can already guess the variance will be the main contribution to the mean squared error and if we follow the rules I've just written, the bias we will be able to keep small so that will be a negligible contribution if we take the correct measures. The next thing is we need to work out the variance. There what we need to take into account is that the terms in this sum are dependent on each other so we will need to use an argument similar to what we did when we discuss the antithetic variables method. That was the basic Monte Carlo method, one of the variance reduction methods, but it was one where the samples were at least a bit dependent and there we needed to deal with it. So let's see what we get. We have variance of the estimator is variance 1 over n sum j from 1 to n f of xj. Then we have already seen the trick how we can work out the variance of a sum of dependent terms. So, well, before we do that, we can take the 1 over n out and it comes out as 1 over n squared. But then the variance we write as the covariance of this term with itself. So sum j from 1 to n f of xj and then with the same term again. And as I did it before, I want to change the name of the index here to simplify the next step. So I write sum k from 1 to n f of xk, but that is purely cosmetic whether I write j or k here doesn't matter. Good. The reason that that's a useful trick is that the covariance is what's called bilinear, so we can take out the sum both from the first and from the second argument. So what we get is sum j from 1 to n, first sum, and then sum k from 1 to n, that's the second term sum, covariance of f of xj with f of xk. And for this step, it was now important that I use different letters here and there, because otherwise we would have no way to write this double sum and still be able to tell apart which one belongs to this sum and which one belongs to that sum. Good, so that is just following the lines of argument we used before. Now we need to think how do the xj and xk behave and what is actually the covariance between them. And what we did here is we used Markov chains which are time homogeneous. So that means the probability which state we go to next depends on which state have we been to previously, just in the previous step, but it does not depend on what the number of the time step. So the transition probabilities do not depend on time. So since the Markov chain is time homogeneous, we know the time does really not matter. So the covariance f of xj f of xk, we can just as well write as covariance of any two other times as long as they have the same distance as j and k have. So we can write xj plus t here and f k plus t. So I shift everything in time by t. That's for all t positive or negative as long as I don't get negative indices. And then if we assume that j is less than k, what we can do is we can shift everything so that the first term is x0. So we take t equals minus j. So we would get covariance f of x0 and t is minus j. So the other term would then be xk minus j if j is less than k. And if k is smaller, then we could shift it so that the second term ends up at time 0. So that's again because the Markov chain is time homogeneous. So it's only important how many steps that we do, but it is not, it makes no difference whether we would go from time 1 to time 3 or from time 10 to time 12. The only thing which matters is two steps. So here I write everything in terms of how do we go from the initial condition to time k minus j. And that truly holds only if x is stationary. What we really would need to do, so we just discussed, x is not stationary. We don't start in pi. We start in some other distribution and only converge to pi. So we should really shift things not to time zero, but to a time where we are already close to pi. But the idea is the same after, say, after the burn-in period or so. It only matters how many steps do we do, and I just write that as a placeholder for what's the covariance between two samples, which are k minus j steps apart. 
Good. Then the next thing I want to do is I want to write that in terms of correlations. So let's just remember we know correlation of x and y is covariance of x and y divided by variance of x times variance of y. So let's solve this for covariance. What we get is covariance of f of xj and f of xk is correlation of f of xj and f of xk times square root of variance of f of xj times variance f of xk. And again, assuming we are close to stationarity, so say after the burn-in period or at a large time, then both of these variances will be the same because the Markov chain in the end will be stationary or nearly stationary. And also, since we assume we converge to the distribution of x, the distribution of xj in stationarity will be close to the distribution of x. So both variances here will be close to variance f of x. So what we get is that's approximately equal correlation f of xj f of xk times variance f of x. And what I have is variance f of x twice. So what I have really is I have two of these variances and then I have a square root, but that just equals variance f of x. Good. And then as I just argued, this argument here for the covariances, we can in just the same way make for the correlations. So instead we can write that as a correlation of f of x zero and f of x k minus j times variance f of x. And I wrote approximately here because that argument required the Markov chain to be in stationarity and we were only approaching stationarity. So there will be another small error introduced here. And again, that notation is a bit informal. That is just a placeholder for what the correlation between two values, which are k minus j steps apart in stationarity. So we should not really use zero here, but we should use the step far down the line and the step which is k minus j times later. And these things are called rho k minus j. And the name of these correlations is the lag k minus j auto correlation in stationarity. If you have ever learned about time series, you probably have encountered autocorrelation there. They are the same thing, only there they are often discussed for ARP processes and that kind of process. So, and now we just need to put this all together to get the result, namely, so I copy that over. Then here we worked out that covariance, but we worked it out only under the assumption that j is the smaller of the two as we would need to write j minus k here. So to make this easier, I sketched earlier a picture like this. So if j is here, k is here, then we can cover the diagonal separately. There j equals k. We have the covariance of two identical terms and we have variance then. So here we would have some j from 1 to n variance f of xj. And then we have these two triangular regions, one here where j is larger than k and one here where k is larger than j. But since the covariance is symmetric, each term here corresponds to a term with identical value on the other side. So we can just write two times the sum over one triangle. So I do two times, I take the triangle where j is smaller, so j from 1 to n, sum k from j plus 1 to n covariance f of xj f of xk. And then we used this argument before. All of these variances, since we assume we are close to stationarity, and if n is large, that is true for most of the terms, and if we use a burn in, possibly for all, each of these will be close to the variance of f of x. So here we will just get 1 over n squared times n times variance f of x. I write approximately equal here because that's only approximate. And then we have two times, we need to write the one over n squared times sum j from one to n, sum k from j plus one to n autocorrelation with lag k minus j. Good. Now what happens with these autocorrelation functions is that they decay typically relatively quickly to zero. So if k is here and rho k is here, then 
they start at 1, at like 0, because the correlation of a value with itself is 1, and then typically they look like something like this. And there's a question how many steps we need until it decays, but it will decay eventually, and if n is in the millions, then certainly there should be no correlations between the first term and the millionth term, so that will be, let's write, hundreds, but not tens of thousands or millions if the method is any good. Okay, and now we just need to put all of this together. Let me just copy this. In this formula we argued the j are decaying quickly as the index, the lag down here increases. And for this reason, what we can do is we can replace this sum with the sum which goes all the way to infinity. And what we do is we are just adding this tail here, but this decay often is exponential. And once the values are small, that contributes very little. So that will only add a small value to the error. So it will be a more conservative estimate, but not by much. So that's approximately equal one over n variance f of x, I cancel the n with the n squared here, plus 2 over n squared, sum j from 1 to n, sum k from j plus 1 now to infinity, so new upper bound, rho k minus j, the luck k minus j autocorrelation. And now if you look at that, this expression does not really depend on j, namely while we start the sum here at index j plus 1, we are subtracting j here, so what it does is always it adds up all the autocorrelations starting with leg 1. So we start at j plus 1, but we subtract j, so that always is the leg 1 plus the leg 2 plus the leg 3, so this thing we can write just as well k from 1 to infinity rho k. Same thing, I just took out the addition and subtraction of j. So let me put this up here. Here we go. Good. And now we see this term here does not depend on j. So we can use the same trick as we used here for the first term. Namely, that whole expression is 1 over n variance f of x, just copied, plus, and now we have 2 over n squared times n times this sum. And it turns out I forgot a term. Let us go back. There is a mistake. So when I wrote this, I have the covariance, and here I switch to the autocorrelation. But we know covariance is autocorrelation times variance f of x, so I still need to add this. I add this in red so that you know what is correction. So covariance is correct, and that is times variance f of x. Then here that is times variance f of x, and that is times variance f of x, and then this here is also multiplied with variance f of x. So that fixes the mistake. And what I can do again is I can cancel this n with the squared down here. And if I put that all together, you see here's the variance, here's the variance, we can take this out. Here's the 1 over n, here after I cancel is the 1 over n. So what I'm left with is 1 over n variance f of x. And that is all of this term. So I write 1 here. And here is the 2 and the sum of the row k. So we write 2 sum k from 1 to infinity row k here. Let's just check. We have the variance. We have the 1 over n. I just added the 2. I just added the sum. So that is the whole expression. So variance Zn mc mc is approximately equal to 1 over n variance f of x times 1 plus 2 times the sum. So final step from that we get mean squared error Zn mc mc is approximately equal to variance Zn mc mc. That is approximate equality because I left out the bias, which we have argued can we can make small, but which will never entirely disappear. And that we have just argued for large n is approximately equal to 1 over n variance f of x times 1 plus 2 sum k from 1 to infinity of the autocorrelation with luck k. And this is our final result for the error. And if you look at that, this looks actually not unfamiliar. So we did this lengthy calculation, which had all these arguments in. But what we ended up with, this bit we know. That is the error for standard Monte Carlo. And 
this term here, if you look at it, that is one plus something. And while autocorrelations in theory could be negative in this application, they very nearly always look like this. So what we should expect is the rho kr in this application positive. So we have one plus some positive term. So we see the error for Markov chain Monte Carlo methods will be larger than this thing. One plus something is bigger than one. So it will be larger than the mean squared error of just a Monte Carlo estimate. So one thing we still need to discuss is why would anybody use Markov chain Monte Carlo methods if they have bigger error than Monte Carlo methods. I leave this to the end of this video. So for now let's just notice the fact the mean squared error is larger and the difference is given by this factor. And one thing which people sometimes do to express this is they incorporate that into this n here and call the result the effective sample size. So I just copy that over. So what I mean by this is we write that as 1 over n over 1 plus 2 times sum of 0 k times variance f of x. And then we call that expression in the denominator the effective sample size. So we write 1 over n effective variance f of x, where n effective is what I just wrote. And the reason people do that is so that it's easier to compare to the Monte Carlo error for standard Monte Carlo, namely that would be variance over n. Here it's variance over that number. So with this you can argue that a Markov chain Monte Carlo estimate with n steps has an error comparable to an Monte Carlo estimate with the number of steps given by the effective sample size. So that is just for comparison to standard Monte Carlo. Good. So that finishes our discussion of the error of a Markov chain Monte Carlo estimate. And we will wrap up things in the next and final video of this series. So see you there.